So um, we're here to talk about New York's broken guardianship system. Uh, for everybody watching, uh, I think most people, when they think of guardianships, they think of Britney Spears, uh, maybe other celebrities who've made a lot of headlines. But um, my colleague, Jake Pearson, wanted to know what life was like for the tens of thousands of New Yorkers um, who don't have millions and who are living under uh, legal arrangements where they can't make their own decisions. Their, their welfare has been entrusted to uh, a guardian um, who's supposed to look out for them. So Jake spent six months investigating the guardianship system in New York State, and he found that the system is in shambles leaving tens of thousands vulnerable, voiceless, and giving rise to a cottage industry of nonprofits who take advantage of the people that they're supposed to protect. So, Jake, can you just, uh, to start us off here, tell me uh, the story of uh, Judith, the woman that you focused on, um, and, and what her experience was with the guardianship system? Yeah, sure. And thanks to everybody for joining. And if you've got questions, put them in and uh, we'll see what we can do to, to address whatever comes in. But as, as Mike um, said, you know, the story that I did, which I hope uh, you all have read, features a woman named uh, Judith Spignevich, who spent, um, you know, about a decade as a, as a, as a ward or, um, who, you know, who relied on a guardian called New York Guardianship Services to care for what in the state is refers to as her pers her property needs, you know, housing and finances. There's another type of, there's another guardianship uh, power that um, can address people's um, healthcare needs, their personal needs. But Judith, Judith's was um, for her property needs. And, and, you know, she found herself or the guardianship placed her in this this um, decrepit, deteriorating Queens home apartment on the second floor of this home. And um, there was a, a partially collapsed roof and there was sort of um, perpetual and persistent vermin, r rat infestations, bed bugs, mold, awful conditions. And she complained uh, in a, a number of ways to a number of people, including the guardianship, uh, repeatedly and um, uh, could not get um, her issues addressed in any real satisfactory sense. And what the story documents is the many ways in which the system itself, the way it's designed to sort of help folks in these situations and to check the work of the guardians just, just didn't, didn't do it in her case. And, um, and, and we found in the investigation really tried to show that she wasn't an isolated incident, that there is something structurally wrong. Um, and we can talk more about it, but that, uh, for folks like her who rely on sort of this network of nonprofits, um, uh, there is there is just there are there are yawning gaps uh, uh, for their care to ensure that they're treated with dignity and that their needs are met. Can you talk about for for, for a second, like as you said, you know, you you've invested you know you investigated this for uh, six months. You talked to a lot of people. You read a lot of documents. And, you know, you focused on, on Judy um, because she's representative of this group of people that the court system calls the unbefriended. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, in industry parlance, you know, the, the, the term is unbefriended, but, you know, um, for many people who are in need of guardianship or are alleged to be in need of guardianship, um, there is a family member or a friend who can sort of step up and fill that role. And um, there are also sort of professional private guardians, usually lawyers, who are approved by the court uh, to be appointed to fill that role. And they can come in uh, in any number of circumstances, but, but very often when there's sort of a disagreement among siblings or there's a contested guardianship. And so the thinking is by the court to appoint a third party impartial to do all this stuff. Um, but what the investigation revealed and which we wanted to draw attention to, which hasn't gotten um, the sunshine we think it deserves as a matter of public policy and public interest, is that there are, are thousands of people uh, in the city who have um, neither family or friends nor enough money <laughs> to be attractive candidates for a professional guardian who makes a living doing this. And so um, what has emerged or what is in place are a, 
a, a series of nonprofits. There are about a dozen that I identified. Three of them have contracts with the city. And so when Adult Protective Services, when APS gets involved, um, there are these three groups, uh, JASA, Self-Help, New York Foundation uh, for Senior Citizens. And then there are other ones that are uh, private nonprofits um, or, or, or a combination of public funding and private funding. And they can be appointed too for what they call low and no fee wards, folks who don't have substantial assets, who often rely on public benefits and um, or, or, or pro bono who have nothing. And so this, this, this constituency, this group of folks are, um, you know, they don't have uh, lobbying power, uh, they are uh, not wealthy and influential, um, they really do rely on, on either uh, private attorneys who are going to do it pro bono, or there are fewer and fewer lawyers do this. It's too much work. Uh, or these nonprofits that are supposed to basically serve as the social safety net. This is what we, as a society, have sort of created. Yeah. The, and they are, yeah, sorry, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, the, these are the folks that are most in need, right? That's right. And, and, That's right. and what are the types of, you know, we, we've said sort of, you know, the system is in shambles, the system is, is broken. What are the types of outcomes you described in Judy's case, you know, in some really stark detail about her, you know, living with a rat infestation, bed bugs, I think, you know, there was a partially collapsed roof, no heat, you know, these are these are really sort of horrendous living conditions. What are the other types of um, outcomes that you've that you've come across uh, with some of the some of the unbefriended? um cases that you've reviewed well you know it it can be it can be very shocking and and um and it runs the gamut but in the most extreme of cases there's a, a lawsuit that i found involving one of these groups that details um a truly heroic horrific uh situation in which a, a person um, who was under guardianship was living alone in a queen's home and uh the guardian had an heard from her uh, in some time and actually in an annual report filed with the judge um, discloses that over the course of a year they had no contact with their ward they checked emergency rooms and everything and there was nothing and indeed the case managers had knocked on the door rang the doorbell um, with some frequency maybe it was monthly and 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 the truth was is that um, well nobody went inside and it wasn't until this person was um, you know, in hock basically to the utility, to Con Edison, that a meter reader um, came in with the city marshal to, to break down the door and they found this poor person, this poor woman, um, dead in her bed, actually mummified, uh, covered in maggots. And, um, you know, so this is the degree, I think that is the far end of the spectrum, but I think it illustrates, it's, it's a relatively recent case and it, and it illustrates the, 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 the gap in care the uh, reliance on a network of nonprofits that, for many reasons, are over capacity, uh, and and the lack of oversight. Um, yeah, let's, you know who let's who's watching into, the watchmen. Yeah, let, let's right, right. Yeah, who watches the watchmen? Let's let's get into sort of why you know how how all this happens, right? So so in New York State, what is how do people become a guardian? and or how do companies you know become guardians and how is that different from from other states it's really really easy in new york to become a guardian you you, you have to take a class you know it's it's a day-long course um and you know if you're a if you're going to be a professional guardian and get on the court's list of approved guardians there's some vetting you know you have to attest that you haven't been convicted of a crime or face sort of professional sanction but uh, nonprofits don't have to do that, and um, uh, other states have more stringent uh, uh, reporting uh, or, or requirements. You know, I think we write we write in the story that actually in New York uh, there are sort of there's a higher bar to become a nail technician than than a guardian. There's a, a lengthier courses that you have to take. You have to pass tests, and so in some ways the reason why it's Sort of low entry and, and there's a history of this so going decades is that you don't want to make it too onerous for a family or friend to get in place in an emergency situation 
On the other hand, I think there's a growing recognition that it is such a sensitive position, the stakes are so high, um, that there needs to be more than just a sort of um, cursory understanding of what the law requires. Uh, and, and the truth is, is that, you know, maybe lawyers uh, who do this for a living aren't the best candidates to be guardians, that maybe social workers or geriatric care managers or people who have experience with the elderly and the infirm, that they may be better suited for this kind of job. You asked about guardians. I mean, we haven't even talked. They're somewhat above the guardian, too. Uh, we should say, and the law that governs all this is called Article 81 of the Mental Hygiene Law. And the position of overseer is called the court examiner. And that person is usually also a lawyer or accountant and um, is responsible for reviewing the paperwork that the guardian is supposed to file per this law. There's an initial report, there's one every year. And that job is really supposed to be um, checking to ensuring the integrity of the report, to make sure the money isn't misused, and really to make sure that the care of the person is um, is adequate. But what you, in theory, <laughs> but what you what you found right was was that there is a often a sh striking and kind of horrific gap between what's on paper and what's in reality. For sure. I mean, I mean, we actually quote um, a longtime judge and one of the original architects of Article 81 who's been calling for reforms for a year, Kristen Booth Glenn, who says uh, in the story, <clears throat> you know, paper is not enough when it comes to human lives. You have to visit the person. Now, in New York, what we also found is that there are just not enough examiners. I think there are 157, 150 something examiners for more than 17,000 uh, people under guardianship in the city across the five boroughs. So on the one hand, it's a matter of math. How could you possibly expect someone to visit, let alone keep up with the paperwork? On, on the other hand, the, there is there's a real range in the examiner world about um, how much they're going to interrogate spending, how diligent, how stringent, how strict. I have heard from a source once tell me, you know, you want your examiner to be mean kind of, right? You want your examiner uh, to be really uh, kicking the tires, to be putting the screws to you as the guardian to make sure that there are receipts, to make sure that um, anything that looks inconsistent or that uh, props a question is then asked. And, you know, we can talk about it some other day, but there's a very bureaucratic way that this is all done. There's a lot of paper filings. It's, it's, it's onerous. And I think there are legitimate questions to be asked about whether or not this could be streamlined, improved, uh, fast track so that it's more user friendly anyway. But the, but yeah, there's so there's a shortage of examiners. There's a real range in quality. And um, there has traditionally been a lot of difficulty getting examiners to go beyond the paper to look and see what's happening. So let's rewind, you know, a, a little bit right where um, you reported that um, the state's current guardianship law, Article 81, uh, lawmakers passed in the early 90s, right? So 30 years ago, uh, state lawmakers were talking about, you know, a system that didn't work then and, and needed changes, and they made changes. So what changes did they make and why didn't they work? Yeah, and so we should say, you know, <laughs> I think if you're on this call, you might have an idea, but, but guardianship has long been fraught, not just in New York, but across the country. I mean, this is a hard thing to get right for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but, but the law, what existed before the Article 81 passed, I think universally is recognized to have been even worse, okay? And so Article 81 did a really important thing that um, everybody in the this world that I talk to sort of agrees, which is that it, it puts the rights of the ward first and foremost. It, it protects due process, it uh, codifies civil liberties, it instructs the judge to really tailor the guardianship order to that person's specific needs. In other words, not a blanket order taking away all rights forever. So on paper, it does a lot of really good things that I don't think anybody um, argue should be taken away. The, the, you know, as in everything, the proof is in uh, the pudding. The details matter. And in practice, uh, there, there uh, 
is a real gap between the promise of the law and how it's implemented. And so if everybody was following the law the way that it's written and there was enough infrastructure for it to work that way, uh, we might have a different system. But uh, humans are fallible, systems are imperfect. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons we could talk about why that hasn't happened, but it's not happening. And, um, and that is why there's starting to be this consensus that um, Article 81 needs an upgrade uh, in a bunch of ways especially for um, oversight, because um, there is just not enough stringent oversight to ensure that people are not being taken advantage of and are living with dignity. So the, the, uh, there was a really striking quote in, in the story where you talk to um, a former judge who helped craft, you know, Article 81. Um, what did she say about, you know, Article, how Article 81 has played out today? Yeah, well, she, she said, you know, she said in a, um, a more eloquent and sharper way than I uh, just did that, you know, the gap between the law's uh, promise and its practice has has rendered it, I think she says, basically useless. And that, um, you know, keeping people out of guardianship in the first place is the most important thing, she says, because once you do, the quote is, it's the toilet you get, you get flushed down. And, um, you know, there is a growing movement in this world, you know, supportive decision making is the term to try and um, help folks who, who may need some extra help in ways that doesn't, that, that don't um, deprive them of, of key constitutional rights or key rights to make decisions. I think, uh, you know, there are some circumstances where it's unavoid unavoidable probably to have a guardianship, but um, so that's step one for a lot of folks in this world is just to, to rely on it less, that there should be fewer people in guardianship to begin with. Uh, there should be ways to help folks who need folks that doesn't include this sort of incredible deprivation of rights. I mean, if you really do think about it, uh, besides being in jail, there's not another sort of legal arrangement that, um, that, that takes away liberty uh, the way that a guardianship order can. Uh, so it's, it's an incredibly important, sort of awesome in the term of like awesome power, awesome responsibility. And um, because it so often affects people who are vulnerable because they're old or sick or um, what have you, it, it doesn't really get, you know, that's not off, that point really isn't, I think, um, uh, digested by the public at large of just how sort of incredibly important and, and what the responsibility is for the judges and the lawyers and the guardians and the examiners here. I mean, uh, this, is, this is truly sort of a, a unique set of uh, powers that are afforded others over somebody else's real life. Can you just for, you know, maybe just for a minute, to, especially for folks that are watching that haven't read um, your full uh, investigation, you know, you detailed as we talked about, you know, uh, a particular case. Um, uh, can you talk about how um, the failure, right, to oversee um, the guardian? you know, to, to oversee the, the guardian in her case, how did that, um, how did that impact her day-to-day -day life? What sort of decisions um, went unaddressed and, 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 and situations went, went unaddressed um, because there was really no one watching the guardian? Yeah, so, so um, you know, in the story, we, we get into it, but um, what we were able to do with, by, by really examining the case file and, and Judith's um, guardianship case um, and, and mirroring it with interviews and contemporaneous emails that she sent and so forth, um, was demonstrate that uh, because the oversight process uh, is so delayed, literally it, it takes years uh, for what's supposed to be an annual yearly guardianship report to get reviewed, it can take years for that to be completed. Um, and in that time, things happen. <laughs> Conditions deteriorate, things happen. So in Judith's case, actually, um, before the examiner had even reviewed uh, an annual report um, that, had, that had key information that spoke to uh, the living conditions she was in and the instability of her housing, including that the guardian had stopped paying rent, you know, um, she had been evicted. Uh, uh, the house had gone through a foreclosure. There was a very sort of shady ownership history at this house. Um, the, 
the new owners were were writing in court filings that they couldn't get a response from the guardianship. There was a separate lawsuit in Queens Housing Court uh, brought by the city uh, against this new owner for not providing heat and hot water. In other words, these are documented serious court cases, lawsuits that, that spoke to the sort of germane core issue of the guardian, which was her property needs, <laughs> how she was living and how her money was being used. But because of this delay, because of this broken oversight system, it isn't clear even today that any of this information filtered its way up, even on, the, on a delayed basis, to the judge who's sort of quarterbacking the whole thing, who is in charge, who issued the order, who's being briefed. So, so this is a sort of fundamental uh, flaw in the system because key decision makers, A, may not even be getting the information they need, and B, if they do get it, the whole operation is ap operating on a years long delay. And if there's something critical, you know, and you're not able to raise an alarm, uh, you know, some folks in guardianship can't speak, literally. Um, it, if you think about how dangerous that can be, it takes your breath away. So hearing all of all of this, right, reading your story, you had another story this week that that sort of detailed the stories, um, the tales of uh, some other people in, in guardianship um, who also were harmed, um, you know, by the by, you know, under the care, under the, the, the care or watch of this uh, of this company, New York Guardianship Services, it can all add up right to a pretty depressing, bleak uh, picture. So is there, you know, is there anything on the horizon in terms of policymaking, in terms of the state legislature, um, the governor? Are there things that uh, can be done to improve this system that uh, respects, as you say, you know, the dignity of the unbefriended? Yeah, so, you know, look, the a few days after our story ran, the Albany Times Union published an editorial that said the governor and the legislature should address this in a serious uh, uh, wholesale way. In fact, I think they said this is not a whack-a-mole situation. And, you know, the problem is that, um, well, there are a number of problems, but for a long time, the issue of guardianship has sort of been a political football uh, because you know, there are three different sort of committees in the ledge, in the legislature that own it in some fashion. There's aging and health and judiciary. And for whatever reasons, none of them has traditionally taken, taken this on as something that they're gonna be responsible for to commit funding to. to. So um, that said, you know, we have a story coming soon, probably next week that details, um, not just the history of efforts that many people have made over time to try and improve the law, which is the case. I mean, this is not a it's sort of an open secret, but it's not a secret. But also sort of concrete things that legislatures, that, that politicians and elected officials in Albany could do to try and improve um, Article 81 and its promise and to, um, you know, fund it in some fashion because, um, the system right now sort of operates um, by taking money from the accounts of wards. But if those wards don't have money uh, or have too little money, um, it's operating at a loss. And we just know, we just know from the numbers that there are too many folks who have too little um, and there needs to be some sort of dedicated, you know, money alone doesn't do it, but, but it is a measure of um, how seriously people take it. And so, yeah, we, we're going to write about it. There are other people out there who have ideas and have proposed them and are, are lobbying um, the legislature currently. But, um, you know, as I've said earlier, this is not a, a folks in guardianship don't have high powered lawyers and lobbyists. Um, it's, this is not the real estate industry. And so um, a solution comes, I think, if there's enough desire for public interest for common good improvements. Um, and, you know, there has been in the past, the question is, uh, is this gonna be a priority today? We shall see. Um, <laughs> and, and you're gonna be continuing to report on this, right? 
Yeah, I, I'm very, I'm committed to this for the year. I've got some ideas that I'd like uh, to pursue further. I'm always interested in the themes of oversight. I'm always interested in uh, gaps in care. And, you know, if you're interested, if you're watching this and you feel like there's something I should know, I'm happy to, to uh, chat or to read an email. You can always uh, get to me by emailing. It's on the website, but it's just my first name, Jake dot last name Pearson at ProPublica.org. And, um, you know, we're really committed to this uh, as a news organization. We think this is a, an issue of extraordinary uh, public interest and public concern. And so the degree to which you or people you know out there um, have information or have insight or think that there's a case that speaks to a broader structural flaw, do get in touch. You know, we can't do our job well if people who um, know things don't talk to us. So, uh, you know, open invitation, open door policy. Great. Well, I think that that's a good place to end um, for today. Thanks so much for everybody tuning in. Um, you can read Jake's investigation at ProPublica.org backslash guardianship. And to receive important investigations like Jake's, sign up for our big story newsletter for free at ProPublica.org backslash newsletters. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Be in touch.